Good evening, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our Monday night Bible study. Tonight, we will be studying in Proverbs chapter number 22. Once again, that's Proverbs chapter number 22. Before we get started, I want to welcome our brother in Christ uh, to the study tonight. His name is Ravendra, and he was given the link and he joined in. So I just want everyone to welcome our brother uh, to the study. With that being said, once again, we're in Proverbs chapter number 22. Is there any prayer requests before we get started? Any prayer requests? All right, if we have no prayer requests for tonight, Brother Coffee, if you don't mind, would you please open us up with a word of prayer? Absolutely, let us pray. Most gracious Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this day and another opportunity, Father, to gather together with the saints. Father, we thank you, Father, for allowing us to uh, meet at such a time, Father, hear another portion of your word. We thank you, Father, for your manservant, Father, which is putting together a message for us, um, recorded in the scriptures, Father, that it will be right or divided. And we just pray, Father, that the things which are said tonight and discussed, that you'll be pleased uh, with, the, uh, with the teaching tonight. So, Father, we just pray that you will clear our hearts and minds to receive what you have prepared in your word. We ask, Father, to forgive us, Lord, of our sins and cleanse us, Father, from all unrighteousness. And we thank you and ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that prayer, Brother Coffee. Once again, everyone, we are in Proverbs chapter number 22 tonight. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Brother Stevenson. Okay, good evening, brothers and sisters. And again, thank you, Brother Green, for allowing me the opportunity to teach God's word. We're in Proverbs chapter 22. And just before we start reading, I just want to remind us all that Proverbs, these are Proverbs, not promises, okay? And so these are general rules, general principles uh, that if they are used, uh, the situations that uh, we take from these wisdom literature will more likely than not uh, transpire, okay? And so it's a reminder, these are proverbs and not always promises, okay? This is just the way things would usually go. And so what Solomon is doing is he's teaching us about wisdom. And that's, how, that's something we should pray for as Christians. We should be praying for wisdom. And let me tell you what wisdom is. Wisdom is the ability, brothers and sisters, to use the knowledge that we have in a skillful way. That's all wisdom is. You can have knowledge and not be wise. And so when we talk about wisdom, we're talking about taking the knowledge that we have, uh, godly knowledge, and, and using this wisdom in a godly way, okay? And so this is where we are in Proverbs chapter 22. I'm going to read verse number one through four. He says, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. The rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hide it himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. By humility and the fear of the Lord, Lord, our riches and honor and, and life. Okay. And so he starts off in these first four verses uh, talking about the uh, true riches. Okay. And so we have to understand uh, godly wisdom understands what true wisdom is. Okay. And we understand that true wisdom or true riches, forgive me, is having godly wisdom. And so as Christians, we need to make sure that we are concerned about our legacy, our name. In verse number one, you see the good name is rather to be chosen rather than great riches and loving favor rather than than silver or gold. And if you're a Christian, uh, you got that name from God. God made you a Christian when you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. You were you were put into Christ. And so you and I need to be concerned about representing that good name uh, that we have if you've obeyed the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. And what Solomon is saying is it's more valuable, or it should be, it should be more valuable than silver and gold. Now, I hope we understand that. To be with Jesus and to be in the kingdom of God, dear son, should be seen and wisdom teaches us this, it should be seen greater, more greater than silver or gold. And for some people, we understand it's not. When you look at the New Testament, Judas, uh, having Jesus was not greater value to him uh, than silver or gold, uh, because he sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, okay? We need to remember that. And so what he also teaches in the verse that we read, in verse 2, the rich and the poor meet together, but the Lord is the maker of them all. And that's something we have to understand as well. I'm going to say this again, the rich and the poor meet together, but the Lord is the maker of of them all. And the point is, it doesn't matter if you're rich or you're poor, brothers and sisters. Well, we have to understand God made the rich person and God made the poor person because they're all people. Everybody was created in the image of God. And you and I need not to be valuing people based upon the things that they have. And there are many people that put value on people based upon the 
the property or the possessions that they possess. And what you and I have to understand, the rich and the poor meet together. Death is a great equalizer. At the end of the day, all of us came into this world naked and all of us are going to leave naked at the end of the day. And so what a prudent man, he foresees the evil in verse three. He hides himself, but the simple pass on. And he says he passes on and he and, and they are punished. And so what we have to do is we have to be wise is what we have to do uh, as as Christians, as members of the body of Christ. You know, we, we can't be deceived uh, about riches. You know, those who are simple will think that money is where it's at. You know, and they'll go down that road to search after money, to seek after money with all their heart and all their mind and all their soul. And at the end of the day, they're going to find out that, you know what, this money really didn't matter at the end of the day. What matters, and I'm going to say this, I'm going to show that. What matters, brothers and sisters, is that not the power or the possessions that I have in this world. At the end of the day, what matters is that my name is written in heaven. I'm going to make sure you get that. Uh, a good name is rather be chosen than great riches. Remember back in Luke chapter 10, and you turn there with me, in Luke chapter 10, remember Jesus gave power to some of his disciples to go out and, and cast out demons in and, and Luke chapter 10 and verse number 17, and they come back and they're, man, they are boasting about this power uh, that God, Jesus, has given them in this world. World. But Jesus says something here in Luke chapter 10 and verse, give me one second, Luke chapter 10 and verse number 17. Yeah, I was right on that. Luke chapter 10 and verse number 17. Listen to what he says here. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject unto us through your name. He said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give you power, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you, notwithstanding in this rejoice. Not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names, here we go, are written in heaven. Now, that's what it's about. That's why you and I need to understand a good name uh, should be, you know, rather chosen over uh, gold and over silver. Anybody have any question on the first four verses before we move on? Not gonna, let me say this, as we go through this, I'm not going to talk about every scripture because a lot of it is redundant. We've already talked about many of the, the, the wisdom scriptures that Solomon gives here, but I'm going to just uh, highlight some of them as we go, as we go through this, as we go through this text. OK, so now we go to verse number five. Go back to Proverbs chapter 22, Proverbs chapter 22. We go back there and we'll, we'll read, uh, we'll read verse number five, where the wise man Solomon says this, thorns it. And snares are in the way of the forward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. All he's saying there is the way of people who don't live right, the way of the unfaithful is hard. And I think we understand that. It is hard for those who are not walking by faith, those who do not know God. He says, thorns and snares are in the way of the forward. But he that keep his soul shall be far from them. This is why wisdom is so important, brothers and sisters. Godly wisdom is so important because it'll keep us from a lot of hurt, harm, or danger in our life. Verse six, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And again, that's why I started off letting us know these are not promises. There's many parents that raised their children right and, and trained them right, but their children didn't always do. And, and some of them are not doing right. And so, again, these are not promises. But what he's telling us is the general rule is when you raise your children right, when you dedicate your children to the Lord, raise them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, train them up the way they shall go, then they will not depart from it. Now, yesterday I preached a sermon on... Um, uh, mothers of influence actually is what it was. And I used, I used Jochebed and Amram from the book of Exodus chapter, uh, Exodus chapter two. And, uh, it, it's a powerful study when you understand, um, and these are Moses as parents for those who may not know Jochebed and Amram were Moses as parents. And I'm going to tell you, they raised this child or she did in a, in a, a difficult time, uh, in Egypt, you know, Joseph is dead. The, the King that knew Joseph is dead. And, uh, there's a, or the, creed that had put out that, that say kill all the male boys. But this woman, Jochebed and Amram, they taught Moses at a young age. They taught him about God at a young age. How were they able to do it? Because they walked by faith. This mom was able to, I'm going to tell you, she was able to, to teach her child and get paid for teaching her child by the Egyptian household when you read the text. Uh, go to Hebrews 11. I do want to read this to you. Brothers, I'm going to tell you, it's faith. That's all you and I can do as parents. You need to walk and live by faith. You need to burn the midnight oil. You need to be sitting down, talking with your children while they're young. Amen. While they're young and they're tender. 
where you can set the example and teach the example and most of all be living the example because that's exactly the, the type of environment that Moses grew up in. Moses was a Hebrew, uh, a Hebrew child, but he was raised in the house of the Egyptian. That's what he was raised. But while his mother had him, she was still able to teach him in the short amount of time she had him. She was still able to train him up in the way that he should go. In Hebrews 11, how were they able to do this? In Hebrews 11 and verse 23, the Bible says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, he was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. They weren't going to kill their child, even though the king was having all the Hebrew boys thrown into the Nile River. He says, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, listen to this, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Isn't that something? Where did he learn that at? Those this, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ. Greater, listen to this, here's where riches is. Riches than the treasure in Egypt, for he had respect on the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, just like his mother didn't, did not fear the wrath of the king. What could happen to her if she kept her male boy alive? He didn't fear the wrath of the king. He learned that from his mama, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And I'll stop right there. And so what I'm saying is what Solomon is teaching us is you need to train up your child in the way he should go. No doubt he understood that's what his dad did for him. His father, David, who you don't see ever serving any other gods, but the true and the living God. Solomon understood my dad trained me in the way that I should go. Now, did Solomon always do what's right? Of course not. But uh, again, at the end of the day, he knows something. He know his father taught him better. And at the end of the day, that's every parent's responsibility to train up your child in the way he should go. Now, verse seven, going back to Proverbs 22 and verse seven, he says, the rich ruler ruleth over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. We understand that. If you're blessed in this world, you're the one that people are coming to for, for help and, and, and for you to help them meet the need that's going on. And so he says, and it says, the rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. If you got a job, if you're on here, you have a job. Let me tell you something. You have a job because you depend on someone who's richer than you. That's why you have the job. Whoever you work for, you work for them because they have something you don't have, something you need from them. And that's just a part of life. No getting around that. Verse 9, he that had uh, a bountiful eye shall be blessed. For he giveth of his bread, he says in verse 9, he giveth of his bread uh, to uh, I'm sorry, verse uh, verse number eight, forgive me. Uh, go back up to verse number eight. He that sought iniquity shall read vanity. That's what I wanted to read. Make sure I don't get past that. He that sought iniquity shall read vanity and the rod of his anger, he says, shall fail. And so we understand that principle. You reap what you sow. I think all of us know that. You reap what you sow. And so if you sow iniquity, you're going to reap iniquity. And at the end of the day, you're going to come up empty. And the rod of his anger uh, shall fail, okay? And verse number nine, he that has and a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread, uh, he says, to the poor. Now, I want to stop here for a minute, brothers and sisters. I want to hone in on this. You know, you and I have to understand that everything that we have came from God. God is the source of everything you and I own. And so if God has blessed you and I with things, he didn't bless you and I with things to hoard it to ourselves. That's not how God operates. God blesses us for the purpose of being a blessing. And so he says in his verse, he that hath a bountiful eye, this at this, shall be blessed. For he giveth of his bread to the poor. That has always been the mindset, brothers and sisters, of the God that we serve. That you reach back and you help those who can't help themselves. Go, 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 go back to the law of Moses. Go back to Deuteronomy 15. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 15. I'm going to tell you, when you give to those who can't provide for themselves, God will bless you. And I'm, I'm going to tell you that, that God will bless you because that's just who God is. Let me tell you something. What God did to us while we were poor, he gave to us. That's what he did. He gave the best of heaven because we were definitely poor on our way to hell is what we were on our way to. But the Lord showed his grace and his mercy to us. And he expects you and I to do the same exact thing with the blessings he has blessed us with. Now look at Deuteronomy 15 and look with me in verse seven. If there be among you a poor man of one of your own brethren, 
within any of your gates in the land which the Lord your God giveth thee. You shall not harden your heart, nor shut your hand from your poor, from the poor, from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide unto him and shall surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanted. Beware that there be not a thought in your wicked heart, saying the seventh year, the year of release is at hand and your eye be evil against your brother, your poor brother, and you give him not, and he cry unto the Lord against you, and it be sin unto thee. Let me tell you what's going on here. If you know biblical history, Old Testament history, the seventh year was a year of release. That was a year of, if, if somebody owed you something, if it was the seventh year, you were to release the debt. That's what what he's saying here. And so he's talking about the wicked. What they would do is they say, you know what, man, tomorrow or even next week will be the seventh year where I'm supposed to release these people. So I'm not going to give this guy nothing. <laughs> I'm going to wait uh, to give it to him. I'm not going to meet his need because as soon as I give it to him, I, I've got to release the debt. So you got a wicked heart. That's, the, that's what God is judging. Your heart is wicked because you're not giving out of love. You're not giving out of compassion. Passion, you're giving out of selfishness. That's what you're giving out of, and God sees that. So look in verse 10. You shall surely give him, and your heart shall not be grieved. Y'all see that? Grieve when you give unto him, because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless you. Now, notice what happens when you give with the right spirit. God shall bless you in all your works and in all that you put your hand unto. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. That's why I have a problem with prosperity preaching. That's a, that's a problem when people think that God is with you because you're rich. That don't mean you have God because you got a lot of stuff. That mean God is with you because you have a lot of a lot of physical stuff. We're gonna always have the poor among us. And so he says the poor will always be there. Therefore, I command you, God says, you shall open your hand. He keeps saying it, wide, huh? Wide unto your brother. I mean, let it go. That's what that means. Stop holding on so tight. To your brother, so the poor and your needy in your land. That's who you open your hand to. Okay. So what Solomon understood, going back to Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 9, he that had bountifully a bountiful eye shall be blessed. If you have an eye looking out for the needs of people, God's going to bless you. For he give you because you give your bread to the poor. Any questions on those verses? Any questions on the first nine verses already? We've already talked about. All right. Uh, go ahead, Brother Coffee. A uh, great example of, of what you're teaching, uh, Brother Henry, is actually in Matthew chapter 25, when he teaches, uh, when I was hungry, he's teaching when I was thirsty, when I had meat, uh, when I was naked. And so he's just giving a, a perfect example of how we as believers ought to treat our neighbors, and especially our brother. You know, as you said before, you know, if God didn't open up any of these doors for us, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be in a world of a trouble. Amen. Be begging, we'll be all beggars. Amen. But, you know the things that we have, and I like the word you use. It's not for us to be hoarding it. And one of those words that that you were were reading, um, in chapter twenty two, it talks about giving generously. You know, not just you know just giving you badly enough is the same example as the uh, Samaritan. You know, he gave. He was in, in anticipating giving more than it was needed. If the if there was needed more care of the one that. That's my point, but it's great. Amen. Teacher. Great point. That's exactly right, my brother. God, great point, my brother. Yeah, he was looking to go above and beyond the need. You know, hey, if this, if this month, if if he's gonna need more, here I got it. You know, this I'm gonna leave need this amount of money, and uh, and and uh, and just in case there's a greater need than what I've already done. Amen. God bless you, brother Green. Yeah, and another thing that I want to add to what you and brother Coffee was saying, I noticed he said your brother. You know, That's right. which is the same thing Jesus said again in Matthew 25, when you've done this unto the least of these, your brethren, you know, my brethren. And I want to say that to show that even in the Old Testament, and then when we read what Jesus said, you know, concerning works of the church, you know, to help your brethren, you know, not Amen. to go out there and try to save the world, you know, given to the world, but to the brethren. So that's all I want to share, my brother. Yeah, well, that's, you know, the, the work of the church is to give the world the gospel. But again, and I know everyone knows this, but I'll say it because it's being recorded. But if, if you and I see a human being, like like that is the good Samaritan. You know, this this guy was a Samaritan. He wasn't one of them. And he, he fell 
into some trouble uh, while uh, while on the road to Jericho when you read that story. And so he stopped and he met the need simply because the guy was a human being. I hope we understand that. If you can help a human being, a need, again, it has to be a need. Again, I want to make sure we get this. These are not promises. You have to still do your investigation and your homework. You don't have to give uh, everything to everybody, every uh, beggar panhandler that you see when you pass by in the street. That's not what he's teaching you and I here. We got to make sure we understand that because some of them can, can be doing better, but they choose to drink beer and don't want to follow rules. So you have to understand this is all he's teaching us, brothers, is, is how to be wise. And so we got to be careful when we study that we don't take a scripture and start isolating it like we teach the denominational world and make it a commandment. Every needy person I see, I got to give a sandwich. So every sign I see of a person that says they're hungry, I got to give them something. That's not what he's teaching there. You have to do your home, but if there is a need, you can meet a legitimate need, then you meet the need. Did I see a hand up? Okay. All right. So now, uh, Proverbs, going back to Proverbs 22. Uh, go ahead, Galatia 820. Yes, sir. Good teaching, brother. I just Thank want you. to read uh, Matthew 26, uh, verse 7. There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box, very precious ointment, and poured it on his head. He said, I meet but when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, to what purpose is this waste? This ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said to, unto them, why trouble you the woman? For she has wrought a good work upon me, for ye have the poor always with you. But me, uh, you have not always. For in that she had poured this ointment. On my body, she did it uh, for, for my burial. And so when it comes to the mindset of the disciples, uh, they're calling it a waste uh, on Jesus Christ, you know, the, the one who made all things. And when it comes to their heart, their heart has to be also uh, wise concerning, uh, you know, when to give to the poor and who, who they're doing, it, who she's doing it for. You know, they're not realizing that this is a maker. And this woman is doing this to honor him, uh, also because she has love for for Christ. And so they're they're not they're go, being trying to be over righteous uh, in a way because they're not looking at the it's, it's like a sacrifice in a sense because she's giving a lot a, a, a woman that costs a lot, but she's doing it because she, Jesus Christ is worth and you know worth so much. But uh, I just wanted to show that Jesus said you have the poor always with you. Um, and that's a point where we have to manage our heart and recognize, um, you know, what, who we're doing it to. Because we offer spiritual sacrifices to God. You can always uh, give to the poor. And sometimes when it comes to, um, you know, the mindset of the world is is to give to the poor, but they don't give a right sacrifice to God that they're mm. supposed to give. They don't give give the spiritual ointment that Christ deserves on the first day of the week, but they will give to the physical poor, but it's, it's of no value if you're not also given the ointment of sacrifice to the Lord that he's expecting. So I just want to. Amen. God out. bless you, my brother. Great point. Great point. Anyone else? Uh, brother Kenny, can I get you to read 10 through 16 for me, my brother? 10 through 16, Proverbs 22. Yes. Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out, yea, strife and report, reproach shall cease. He that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, and he overthroweth the word of the transgressor. The slothful man says, there is a lion without, I shall be slain in the streets. The mouth of the strange woman is a deep pit, he that is abhorred of the Lord shall fall therein. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the road of correct, the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. 16. Verse 16. He that oppresses the poor to increase his riches, and he that giveth to the rich shall surely come to want. Mm. 
Amen. God bless you, my brother. Okay, so go back to, down to verse 10. The powerful scripture, cast out the scorn and contention shall go out. Uh, yea, strife and reproach uh, uh, shall cease. I think we understand that. You know, you get rid of the troublemaker, you get rid of the ones that's causing the problem, then, you know, the fire will go out. Um, and, and, you know, you think about, as I'm thinking about just as talking about this, you think about uh, Abraham and Sarah. Y'all remember? Go, let's go back. Genesis 21. I'm, I'm trying to go to Genesis chapter 21. Try not to be long, but uh, make some highlights some point. Genesis chapter 21, brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you something. You know, God has a problem with those who sow discord among brethren. You don't want to be the, you don't want to be the person, uh, brothers and sisters, that is causing contention and strife. You know, uh, you're going to have a problem with God. You know, and it's why you and I always have to have a mindset to want to do the right thing. You know, Abraham and Sarah didn't do the right thing. Abraham listened to Sarah. He married Hagar. And then now they have a child. Uh, not the way God wanted Abraham to have a child, because God was very clear that your wife Sarah is going to have a child. But nonetheless, they concoct this plan. And again, when you go against God's divine order, or God's divine plan for how you should be doing things, get ready for trouble in your camp. Just understand that. Get ready for trouble when you and I don't act the way God would have us to act in your home or in the church. Get ready for trouble. That's just no doubt about it. It's coming unless you fix it. And here was a case with uh, with uh, Abraham and Sarah. In Genesis chapter 21, let me find the verse. Oh, give me one second. Genesis, I know it's Genesis chapter 21, verse number, yeah, verse number nine. Listen to this. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar. Now, remember, this is Ishmael, the Egyptian which she had born unto Abraham mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. Y'all see that? So what happens is, is, is Sarah fed up, you know, with Ishmael and, and, and Isaac uh, going at it. You know, whatever, whatever was going on, she was fed up with it. You know, what was going on between her and Hagar. And so what she said, no, you got to get her out of here. And he grieved about that. OK, but at the end of the day, when you read the story, God said, no, do exactly what she told you to do. God told, no, OK, you listen to her. Let her go. Let, let Tell him to go. And that's exactly what happens there. And so the point is, going back to Proverbs chapter 22, brother, so I'm going to tell you something. We got to make sure that we're not the ones causing strife. OK, make sure you're not the one causing strife. Uh, it's amazing. You know, people can have peace when you ain't around. Why is that? Why, why is everything going well when you ain't around? You just might be the problem. I don't know. But you need to make sure that you're not. OK, it's not always the case, but you need to make sure that it, that it's not the case. OK, now, verse 11, as was read, going back to Proverbs 22, he that uh, loveth uh, pureness of heart for the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. Y'all see that? He that loveth pureness of heart for the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. Uh, the idea behind that, brothers, is, is a, you know, a pure heart, let me say this, is seen in what we say. That's the idea. Your heart, words mean something. I want to make sure you and I get that. What you and I say means something. It really is evidence of what's in your heart. This is why you and I need to be filtering our words. You need to think long enough before you speak. Think about the, the, the ramification of your words before you spew them out of your mouth. Because you will, and I will, give an account for the things that we say. Go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. This, this is a problem, brother. We got to use wisdom. All he's talking about is we'll be wise. Think long enough before you speak. That's what you have to understand. Understand that words have power. That foolish uh, tale we used to sing, and uh, and again, I understand the principle behind it. You know, when you, you were taught it in school, sticks and stones may break my bone, words may never hurt. That's you know that that's really not true at the end of the day. And I know it was said just to keep you from from laying your hands on somebody in school just because they said something. You know, but and I understand that part. So you have to know who you are. And if somebody says something about you, well, you know that's not who you are. But at the end of the day, words do have power. And so in Matthew chapter twenty four, Jesus says this in verse thirty four: "Old generation of vipers, how can you?" This is what he says: "Being evil, speak good things." For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and the evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, Matthew 12, 36, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account 
in the day of judgment. For by your words, you shall be justified. And by your words, you shall be condemned. Now go back up to verse 34 again. He says, old generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? Isn't that amazing? You know, even if an evil person, I'm going to say this, I want you to get this. Even if an evil person says the right thing, if their heart's not right, it's still evil. Y'all understand that's how God judges you. You can say the right thing and still have a wrong motive because you're evil. Because the only reason you're saying it is somewhere you're looking for a, something that benefits you. And it's not because you're worried about how God thinks about what you said or you're, you're thinking about how you can help other people by what you said because your heart is evil. This is what Jesus means. It's not saying that a bad, an evil person can't have words come out of their mouth. Yeah, they can, they can say good things all the time, but they're evil when they say it. Okay, so now going back, going back, going back. And so he says, he that loveth pureness of heart for the grace of his lips, the king, notice what he said, the king shall be his friend. But verse 12, here we go. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge and he overthrows the words of the transgression. Don't you love that about God? I love that about God. His eye, the eyes of the Lord preserve not. That's what knowledge is. And God's words are not going to come back void, brothers and sisters. And what he does, he overthrows the words of a stranger. You know, a beautiful example of that when you go to Numbers chapter 24. Go there with me. Numbers chapter 24. You look at a, you look at Balak trying to get Balaam to curse Israel for a reward. And that's what he's trying to curse him for. Ba Balak is trying to get Balaam, who's a prophet, to go and curse Israel. That's what he wants to do. He wants to curse him because Balak has promised if you can just curse Israel as, as God's prophet, he says, Balak, Balaam said, Balak said, I'll give you a reward for it. But every time he tried, three times, he tried to curse Israel. You know what? All that could come out of his mouth was blessings. I love God because God at the end of the day is in control of the words. Now listen to this, number 24. I'm not going to read this all, but I just want to show you the results after he did try tried to curse God's people. In Numbers chapter 24, look with me in verse number 11. The Bible says, matter of fact, let's go up to verse number 10. And Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam. Now, Balak is the one that tried to get Balaam to curse Israel. He's angry because it never worked. And listen to this. And he smote his hands together. That's what he did. And Balak said unto Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies. And behold, you have all together blessed them three times. Therefore, now flee you to your place. I thought to promote you under great honor, but lo, the Lord had kept you back from honor. You see that? He understands that. He understood who was in control of that whole situation. The Lord, what the Lord was. And Balaam said unto Balak, spake I not also to your messengers, which you sent unto me, saying, if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold. I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of my own mind. But what the Lord said, that will I speak. And now behold, I go unto my people, come therefore, and I will advertise you what this people shall do to your people in the latter days. Y'all see that? And so Solomon knew exactly uh, he knew exactly what he was talking about in verse number 12 of Proverbs 22. The eyes of the Lord preserved the knowledge and the overthrow, he overthrew the words of the transgression. Any questions on those verses so far? All right, so look at verse number 13. Listen to what he says here. The slothful man said, there's a lion without and I will be slain in the street. Now he's going to deal with lazy people. That's what he's dealing with, the lazy people here. And again, brothers and sisters, it's not wise to be lazy you know, and afraid to do what God has blessed you and, and created you to be able to do. And so he tells us here that the lazy, the slow, that's what that word means. They say there's a lion without. You know, why would they say that? You know, why would a person say there's a lion without? Because they're scared to work. That's what they are. They're scared to work. And so they try to find excuses of why they can't go to work, why they can't do something. You know, and you notice when you look at this too, and this is what I find humorous in a way, is, you know, when you have meetings, I've, I've experienced this in the church the number of years I've been in, you have a lot of brothers and sisters in the church when you have business meetings, they do a lot of talking, you know, they, 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 they talk big, you know, and it's like this guy here, he's doing, there's a lion in the street, 
It was a line without I should and and should be laying and laying in the street. And so he, he's doing a lot of talk, got a lot to say. And they start creating stuff. They create lines, create stuff to do. But then when it comes time to do it, nowhere to be found. Isn't that amazing? Start creating stuff. Well, we need to do this. We need to do that. That needs to be done. This needs to be done. OK, uh, we put it on the list and then they know where to be found. Well, where, where are you at? doing all that talking. You got all these great ideas of what should be done and what's not being done. But then all of a sudden now you're creating lines. Ain't no one, nowhere, nobody don't see you. Time to work, time to go knock doors, time to teach, whatever the case may be. Now you know where to be found. Why? Where are you at? Oh, there was a line in the street. Yeah, you had something to do, didn't you? Yeah, I know it. Brother Kennedy, go ahead, Brother Kennedy. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, it kind of when I was thinking about this, it, it kind of brought me to the mindset of, uh, you know, doing uh, COVID. You know, there was a lot of assistance that a lot of people was getting and rightfully so. Um, you know, the world the, was in a bad shape. The economy was terrible. But then when it was an opportunity to go back out there and go to work, you know, people didn't want to go to work. They they wanted to keep them checks coming in. So they were coming up with however many excuses. And I mean, there were some people that were legitimately you know, unable for whatever reason. But then those who were able to go back to work, they just refuse. And whatever excuses, whatever they can create in their mind to say they needed to say to not go back to work, uh, they would say it. So it just kind of reminded me about that. <laughs> Great point, brother. You are you're exactly right. Brother says if you're not, if you're not using the talents and the gift, you know, Jesus tells that parable, I'm not gonna go to it, but you can read in your own leisure in Matthew 25 of the unprofitable profitable servant who God, he gave one talent to him. What did he do? He went and hid it and he buried it. Why? Because he was afraid. But says, you can't be afraid and I can't be afraid to use uh, the talents and the gifts that God has, has given me and given you to do the work. Otherwise, what you're doing is you're destroying the work. Do you understand that? If God has blessed you and I with a gift, a talent to uh, work and I'm, I'm not just talking about, of course, you need to work to take care of your family. I'm talking about even working in the church. You can't be lazy. You have to use that talent. Otherwise, you're destroying. You understand that? You're destroying the work. You're helping destroy the work when you don't use your gift or your talent. Proverbs 18, 19, verse 9, we read this already. But back in Proverbs 18 and 9, he says, He also that is slothful in his work is a brother to him that is a great waster. Proverbs 18 and 9. So when you have, and I have something that God has blessed us with to be able to do, you know, if you don't do it, then yeah, I'm telling you, brother, so, so you, you, you are a destroyer. You're a great waster to the work, you know? So instead of you getting out the car and helping us push it, you sitting in there making the work heavy. You know, you ever had a car, <laughs> you ever ran out of gas in the street, uh, boy, and, 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 and everybody else wants to sit in the car. You got to, somebody needs to get out. I mean, you got five people in the car. I'm going to ride with my buddies one time. I'm five people in the car, and the car ran out of gas, and four, four of them want to sit in there. For what? To make the person, one person pushing it heavy. What kind of sense does that make? And that's what I'm telling you. Some of us do in the church. Want to sit there on the pew, and everybody else is doing the pushing. You know, my goodness, get up and do something. All right, I'm going to leave that alone. Going back to Proverbs chapter 24. And so look with me in verse number, verse number 14. He said, the mouth of a strange woman is a deep pit. He that is aboard of the Lord, he says, shall fall there in okay and so he's letting you know their words are a trap we talked about this as this woman back in proverbs chapter 7 if you remember this woman that came to this man and then she had this young man this simple man and all she did was use some word man you the one i've been looking for you know and and made him feel special you know he bought all into that and before you know it he he found himself in in, in sin is what he found himself in and so what solomon is teaching us is be careful brothers and sisters of words that are simply traps okay or trap the mouth of a strange woman is a deep pit he that is aboard of the lord you're the ones that's going to fall into it you understand that and so if you don't take god's word serious if you don't take god's word to heart you're the one that are listening every wind and wave of doctrine that comes your way and we have a lot of saints, brothers and sisters, who don't study, who don't take God's word serious enough. And because they haven't done so, uh, they follow the flattering words. There are a lot of saints that are now in denominational churches 
Somebody say, are there Christians in, in some denominational church? I would say, yeah, in the sense because they left the church. And yeah, that's why there's Christians sitting. If there's Christians sitting in denominational churches, it's because they left the church. That's that's right. Because they got carried away by every wind of doctrine. I know some Christians right now sitting in seven-day Adventist church who obeyed the gospel. And now they're in the seven-day Adventist church. They're in the Baptist church who obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you have to understand that. And so because you got you to gotta watch out for these words. And, don't, and people who hate God will fall for those words. You know, this is why Joseph... I love Joseph in Genesis 39. This is why, even though he's in a foreign land, he's away from home, he's away from his parents. I'm going to tell you, them 17 years that he had with his dad, there was some powerful 17 years. This is why I said you need to train up your child the way you should go, because you're not going to have them long. Joseph was in Egypt and away from home at a young age, but he remembered what his daddy them told him. He still knew his God, even though he was in a foreign land. And so when Potiphar's wife kept coming at him day by day, he understood, no, I can't do this great sin and sin against God. Well, how could he do that? Because he knew God was real. He knew what God's word said. He was not going to give in to her enticing words coming after him day by day by day. And brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you, that was wisdom. That is godly wisdom. Okay. And that's exactly what Joseph had. Okay. And so the mouth of a strange woman is a deep pit. OK, and he said, verse 15, and we already talked about this. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but a rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Yes, there are times you need to put something on their behind. I'm going to just say that. And there are times where you have to put something on your child's flesh. To pull the nonsense out of them. Please understand that. Now, again, you use wisdom. You don't have it's not always where you have to use a rod on their backside. But there are times where you do need to do it. OK, that's what he's saying there. And make sure when you do it again, it's not focused on the family, but make sure when you do it as a parent that you're not doing it just because you're angry or just because you understand that discipline is for teaching. Make sure you're 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 in a teaching mode because you love your child, your children, and you want to make sure that they go down the right road. That's what you're supposed to do. OK, now, verse 16, I think we know that he that oppressed the poor to increase his riches and he that give it to the rich shall surely come to want. OK, now what he's teaching there is if you if you're an individual that is 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 rich and you take from the poor to give to somebody else who's rich, that means your heart ain't right. God going to deal with you. And there are people that do that, that what they'll do is they'll take from somebody lesser or who have lesser and they'll take it because they want to be somebody to somebody else and they'll give it to the richer looking for something in return but god said i'm not asleep god said i see that you're going to come to want yeah god's going to make sure you're going to come to want if that's your mentality to take from somebody else who's poor what they have remember david isn't that what david did isn't that the, isn't that the analogy that that nathan gives to david he understood it then that man surely deserved to die or he understood it when it was somebody else who took somebody else's poor man, took his you lamb who he loved. Yeah, David understood that when Nathan, but he didn't understand. That's exactly what you did. David took this man's wife, had him murdered. You got her pregnant and you deserve death. And you don't come to want. Now, I'm going to tell you, so God sees that, brothers and sisters. I'll make sure you get that. And so when you start oppressing the poor to increase your riches, my goodness, you got David had everything he needed. Why in the world would you go take from this man who's faithful to you, uh, nonetheless, who's a great uh, man in your army, and go take his wife and then try to set him up? My good God, didn't God, God didn't handle him though, and God will handle you or I, brother Coffee. Uh, yeah, it's great teaching, brother Henry. Uh, verse number sixteen is is really is prosperity gospel. I mean, these cats get up, you know, these people get up here. And and preach this these work minister do whatever they're doing, and the poor just could lose their minds, and 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 they riding five and six airplanes and sitting on gold toilet. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> gold toilets, <laughs> amen. Amen, though, brother. That, that's exactly right. And they're taken from the poor to increase their riches. That's exactly. And they're and and they're doing it under the guise of religion. They're doing it under the guise of in the name of Jesus. Isn't that crazy? And God, they, God's gonna deal with them. Yeah, they're not getting away. We understand that. So I hope they're enjoying whatever they're enjoying on this side, because I'm going to tell you, eternity is a long time. It's a long time. They're fools is what they are. 
They are fools to take advantage of people that are created in the image of God. Who, When you understand that death is a great equal, you're going to die one day, but yet you choose to be rich toward this world instead of being rich toward God. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. That's beautiful. That is exactly what verse 16 is teaching. All right, any questions on those verses? All right, now, uh, chapter, uh, verse 17, forgive me, through the rest of the chapter, it's a, a different kind of, uh, it's a different type of, uh, wisdom literature that he's using here. Uh, anyway, I'm going to get uh, 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 Sister Vera, uh, Sister Vera, Sister uh, Cheryl, uh, Sister Valier, can you read verse number 17 through verse number 21 for me, okay? And, uh, and before she reads this, I want you to see what he's going to show us here, brother. So he's going to tell us the true value of wisdom. That's what, what these verses are going to show us. We have to value wisdom. If you don't value wisdom, this stuff is going to go in one ear and out of the other. Please understand that. This is why James 1.5 said we ought to be praying, asking God for wisdom. And what God wants to do and what he will do, he'll give it to us. And he won't upbraid us for asking him for wisdom. 17 through verse 21 for me, please. Bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. For it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee. They shall without be fitted in thy lips. That thy trust be in the Lord. I have made I have made known to thee this day, even to thee. Have not I written to the excellent things? I'm sorry, I got the baby in the background. Have not I written to thee excellent things in counsel and knowledge? That I might make thee that I might I'm, I'm I'm so I'm so distracted right now I'm sorry that's okay sister. that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee all right thank you my sister for that reading tell say you we said hi and so he said bow down your ear and hear the words of why that's what we have to do brother so we have to want to be wise and we want to want to apply our heart to knowledge that's just it this is why we're on here tonight right is why we spend time studying the book of Proverbs, I hope, because we, we want to hear and not just be hearers, but be doers of the words. OK, that's simply what he's saying. When we do it, it'll be a pleasant thing if we keep them in our heart. See, we can't, can't wait until we caught him between a rock and a hard place to then want to decide what we should do. See, that's 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 really where the problem comes in, brothers. We've got to already have, have this in us. Again, Joseph already had it in him. By the time he got to Egypt, you understand that? He already had a relationship with God by the time he got to Egypt and Potiphar's wife is coming after him day by day by day. See, when you get out of your bed and I get out of my bed, I need to right then and there announce today, God, you are my king. Jesus, you are the king. And when I believe that in my heart and I hold that in my heart and I'm going to keep my mind on God today, when those temptations come, the choice is much easier. <laughs> it, it's a whole lot easier because my mind is made up. I'm doing what God would have me to do in this situation. And that's what we all need to do. Brother Green. Yeah, Brother Stevenson, what just came to mind in the statement that was just being made is something you said a few studies ago, which, you know, is really powerful when you really listen to it. Uh, you made the statement that too many people want to live and learn instead of learn and live. And just listening to these scriptures and listening to the comments that me and May, you know, if we learn, then that makes the living even easier and even better because it's like, you know, when, when you see these situations coming to you, you already know how to deal with it because you've already learned. Amen. You know, that, that was so powerful to me, you know, and I've been, that's God been you. on my mind since you said it. God bless you, brother. God is that's good. Have, brother. Yeah, that's and, good. And that's exactly, and, and, and I actually got it from Romans 15 and four. I say, that's what God's word says, you know, that we are to learn and live. That's, it, that's exactly what it's for, for, that, for whatever things were written aforetime. They're written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. That came from God's word, Romans 15 and 4. And that's what we're supposed to do. I don't have to go down. We don't have to go down some roads, brothers and sisters, that other people that we have in the scripture have gone down to find out what's right and what's wrong. God's word is true. I don't have to have all the money in the world to know that all the money in the world will not make me happy. You know who experienced that already? Solomon. And he came to the conclusion that here's the whole duty of man. 
to fear God and to keep his command. But yet you're still going to have people who won't try it. Well, maybe Solomon missed something, right? Yeah, everybody in jail are uh, in there because they didn't think they were going to get caught. Yeah, yeah, they got caught, but not me. <laughs> uh, there's something they didn't do right, but I, I'm going to do better. And where they at in jail, and, it, and that's where they are, and that's where they need to be because they're fools. Um, uh, Galaxy, uh, brother Javier, God bless you, brother. Uh, just uh, piggybacking on uh, verse number 18 for it is a pleasant thing thou keep them within thee, they shall with all be fitted in thy lips. And that word fitted is described as confirmed, uh, established, confirmed or established, or um. What's the other word? Uh, fashion, confirm, establish, or fashion. And so it's something that is, it's like you mentioned, it's embedded. Uh, it comes out. It's a uh, part of the structure, you know, uh, something that's like a building that's established. It's, it's, it's sitting, it's not going anywhere, you know, and uh, when it's in a heart, whatever comes out of the heart, like Jesus said, are the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, the heart speaketh, right? So I was just thinking about that word. I looked it up and I just want to talk about it a little bit. You know, if it's settled in us, then it, it's going to be dwelling in us and it comes out. Amen, my brother. God bless you. Can you read verse 22 and 23 where I got you home, my brother? And when he reads verse 22 and 23, he's just going to teach us, uh, tell us something. He's already been telling us how we need to treat the poor fairly, brother. So, so, so. And this is a, a redundant uh, thought throughout the scriptures that you and I should be concerned about those who are less fortunate than we are. Uh, go ahead, my brother, 22 and 23, those two verses. Rob, not the poor because he is poor, neither oppress the afflicted in the gate for the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoil them. Amen. God bless you, my brother. You know, brothers, how a rich person treats a poor person. It really shows their character. I mean, this is kind of what God wants you and I to see. Even when he uses, Jesus uses Luke 16. That, that, that rich man did nothing for Lazarus. Isn't that amazing? He's at his gates. Why is he at his gates? Why is he at the bed? Why does the dogs have to lick his sores? God's always taking this serious. And God has provided enough for the rich man to be able to help that man sitting, notice, by his gates. That's, that's what he wants to make sure you see him. You come in and out every day and you you do you do nothing. You do nothing. This man, why does he have to beg from crumbs, beg for crumbs from your table? Why? Because you're greedy, you're covetousness, you're all about yourself, you look down on people. And we've got to be careful. And that's why I, I'm telling you, he says it's it's hard for a rich man. To enter into the kingdom, well, the idea, but it's possible when you got God. See, it's hard when you love riches, when you have a love for money and not a and not a love for people, and understand why God has blessed you. Okay, all right. So, thank. Any questions on those verses? Any questions on those verses right there? Any questions? Okay. Uh, let me get a sister, uh, sister Carly. Are you in a position uh, to read? I don't know if she is not. Verse twenty four and twenty five. Carly Penner. Okay. Uh, Sister Ferguson, what about you? 24 and 25. Okay. Uh, what about you, uh, Mother dear? 24, 25. And he's going to give a warning when she reads this. She's going to give a thank you, Carly. She's going to give a, a warning. He's going to give a warning of, 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 of being around angry people. Okay. This is wisdom. Again, you know, he's going to show us something about angry people. 24 and 25. Make no friendship with the angry man, and with the furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. You see that? And to, to be hanging around people who hot tempered. Really, it's, it's like living in a, a, a house that's, that's on fire. And that's really what he's saying here, man. You're going to, because eventually what they'll do, brother, so, so they'll bring you down to their level. And they're going to whip you with experience. Angry people can cause you to act out of character. That's all they do. And you got to be careful who you, you hang around. People that just get angry and upset. And you get yourself killed. 
surrounding yourself around people who can't control, don't have any self-control. Make no friendship with an angry man. You driving down the road with them and, and they angry and they shoot and you get you be the one get killed. Road rage and you just in the car. You had no you you know they, they you know they temper. That's why you need to make sure you, you understand the company you keeping and the people you hanging around. That's a thought throughout the proverb, the proverbial right. Go back to Proverbs 14. He talks about that a lot, bro. So there's some people that just can't control themselves, can't control their anger. Don't make no friend with no people like that, man. You better watch it. You better talk to them. You talking about, yeah, that's my home girl, that's my homeboy. Yeah. That's just who they are. Okay. All right. That's just who they are. Proverbs 14, 16, 17. You know they blow up on you. And, and, and so you know what to say, but somebody else don't. They they acting crazy. You can't go to Walmart without wondering what they finna pull off. For, Proverbs 14, 16. A wise man fear it and departed from evil, but the fool rage it and is confident. He that is soon angry, deal it foolishly. And a man of wicked devices, he says, is hated. Y'all see that? Go over to Proverbs chapter 15. Look here what he said in verse number 18. A wrathful man stirreth up strife. You know, I'm telling you, that's what they do. They get so angry, they, they find trouble. Person who's angry, find trouble. And don't let them have a gun. My goodness, they really, my, they really, man, they really got it going on then. And you don't, don't let them be angry, have an anger issue and a gun. Man, I don't be nowhere around him or her. But he that is slow to anger, he says, appease it, strife. You see that? An angry person, all they're looking for is, man, how they can hurt somebody. That's all they're looking for. Go to Proverbs 29. It's a, the Proverbs 29. Look here in verse number 22. And if that's you, let me say this. We're talking about somebody else. But if that's you with an anger problem, let me say this. You need to pray and ask God to help you control yourself. Make sure because you're going to find yourself in a whole world of trouble. If people can't talk to you, your husband can't talk to you, your wife can't, without you blowing up. People are scared to correct you and tell you what you need to hear because they're scared you might do something crazy. You need to ask God to help you if that's you with your spirit. Now, Proverbs 29 and verse number 22, he says, an angry man stirred up strife and a furious man abounded in transgression. You see that? Can't control itself. Can't do it. And if I'm telling you, you may you may be one with anger issues. And, and some people, anger management can't even help you. You need, you need the Lord, you need the spirit to help you. That's what you need. You need to cut all your friends off until you get yourself together. Uh, Brother Kennedy. Yeah, that last part. Um, you know, not only not only friends, but you know, you gotta you gotta cut if you gotta cut things off that that you know isn't for the better of you. Um you know, you, you you see a lot of people doing like uh, gaming type of stuff, right? You know, and sports events and things of that nature. And uh, there's one thing to be disappointed in a loss, but then you see some people just get angry and out of control. And I mean, I think it was not too long ago. I can't remember what championship or what it was that they were celebrating. I think it was the the Chiefs. The Chiefs um celebration and and they someone shot shot up and um end up killing um a, a, a one of the reporters and the thing about it is mm -hmm. these individuals never met each other they never mm -hmm. even knew each other so it wasn't even like a gang violence or anything like that it was just words and anger over yeah. you know during a time when it was supposed to be celebratory so you know yeah. you got to be careful and and just it, it, it ain't it ain't always in the in the areas that we think it is it's just if you know you have an issue and you can't control yourself that's not something you need to be a part of that's right amen my brother amen god bless you anybody else on that okay brother kenny why i got you again my brother oh, let me get my brother claw can i get you to read let me get my up brother kenny uh can i get you to read verse 26 and 27 now he's gonna teach us here that brothers and sisters, you got to use wisdom when it comes to the debt of other people. Okay, you have to use wisdom. We're gonna talk about this once he reads this. Go ahead, my brother. Twenty six and verse twenty seven. Be not thou for them that strike and <clears throat> or them that assuredly debt. If thou knowest to pay. Why should he take away thy bed from thee? Okay. 
Yeah, that's it. That's thank you, my brother. And again, so what he's saying here is, versus, again, he's not saying that it's wrong to co-sign for somebody. It's not the Bible doesn't teach it's wrong to co-sign uh, for somebody. He's not even saying it's wrong uh, to to have debt. He's not. That's not what he's teaching here. What he's teaching in this thing, in this case, in these verses, that the the problem is, you make sure you do your homework. You don't just sign or co-sign for somebody, and then you ain't got nothing to pay. You understand? Because you're signing, you're signing, saying that, you know, if this individual cannot pay, I have what is needed to be able to to come in and make the payment. That's what he's saying. Let me read that again. Be not thou. He's talking about, remember, you got to remember this. He's talking about wisdom. See, if you can't co-sign for anything, let me say, let me say this, because I hear people, I hear saints get this so messed up. It's ridiculous. If you don't, if you can't live in nothing unless you pay for it, many of us on here wouldn't have a mortgage. I'm going to tell you that. You, you owe a debt. I owe a debt. I'm in a house right now. I owe a debt. And I signed for it. My wife signed for it, too. She's on there, too. So he's not talking about, he's not dealing with don't have any debt. My good, you buy a house, you buy a car, you know, you, it's a debt. So he's not dealing with a debt. He's dealing with, if you, if for instance, just say you have a child, you know, you have a kid that's trying to build up credit. Let's just use that. The idea is you can put them and you can sign uh, on a loan or credit card. Just make sure when you do it, you're not putting yourself in debt. See, it may be times where you have to sit down with your child and say, no, you know, I don't have the money. If you couldn't pay, you know, I wouldn't be able to do this. That's wisdom. That's what he's teaching here. Why should they come and take your bed? That's the idea. That's what he, let me read it again. Be not thou one of them that strike hands of them or of them that are surety for debts. If you have nothing to pay, why should he take away your bed from under you? Why in the world would you go put a bond? I know I'm not ever doing this one, putting a bond up for some crime my child done, and then they don't, and I know they knuckle, and they, and they ain't going to go to court. You know what they're going to come do? You ain't getting your money back, and if you bond your house, they're coming to get your house. You see that? Why would I do that? That's that's foolish. And so all he's teaching us, brothers and sisters, is to have with, the only debt that we do owe everybody is a debt of love, Romans 13 and 8. Now, that's a debt we all owe. Please understand that. That is a debt I'm going to always owe, and you're going to always owe people, the debt of love. But when it comes to signing and co-signing, if you don't have it, don't try to act like you got it. <laughs> Tell somebody, no, I don't have it. And I, if, if you didn't pay it, you know, or even if somebody's credit bad, you know, no, wait a minute. No, I can't do this because if you didn't pay, you know, I, I, can't, I can't afford to come take my house or my bed or my comfortability. That's what he's teaching here, okay? Any questions on that? Any questions? All right. So now, uh, verse number, we almost done. Uh, praise God. Let's read verse 28 and 29. Uh, I'm trying to just swap it up. Sister Hernandez, are you in a position this morning uh, to read these verses? Yes, yes my dear brother. Uh, 28 and 29, yes, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Remove not the Ansaya landmark, which thy fathers have said, Cease thou a man's diligence in his business. He shall stand before king. He shall not stand before mean men. Amen. God bless you, my sister. And so what he's talking about in these verses is, brother, we got to respect the old paths, the old way. No, now, the idea of knows that remove not the ancient landmarks. Remember, land, brothers and sisters, is precious. It is even precious today. Land, you know, property, you own property. But the idea is you can't have a heart and a mind said uh to be greedy to try to take over <laughs> to take over somebody else. But you know the people that do that, they try to move the little stakes back. Uh, and move it back and try to take other people's land and just just out of greed and covetousness. And so one of the ideas behind this is he said, don't remove the ancient law about what your fathers have said. And, and when you look at this in the spiritual sense, brothers, I'm going to tell you something. The Bible teaches you and I how to worship as Christians. We have no right to try to remove what the ancients have already said, the apostles, what they taught. You can't remove that by doing your own thing, uh, teaching false doctrine because you're covetous, covetous. And what you're doing when you do that is you're taking away from God is what you're doing. You're trying to anyway. You're trying to take what God has set up. 
And so he said, don't remove the ancient landmarks which your fathers have set. I think about Nabal back in 1 Kings chapter 21 when Ahab wanted his vineyard. Y'all remember that? He wanted, and Nabal said, no, I can't. This is part of my inheritance. I can't sell you this land. And what did what did Nabal, uh, Ahab do? Get mad and whine and pout. And his evil wife Jezebel set him up and had him killed. They're trying to get him to remove his ancient landmarks. Why? Because of greed and covetousness. Because remember, the Bible does say it laid hard by his place when you read 1 Kings 21. So Nabal had all this stuff, but he wanted more. That's the idea. He wanted more than what he was allowed and what God. God would allow him to have, and that's going to always be a problem. Brother Kennedy. What is it? Mark, push me. I don't want to hear. Yes. Um, you know, and and I was I and I was looking at this um just from another perspective because um, you know, and, and I and I agree totally with what you're saying. Um, but I was trying to figure out a way to like because so there are there are traditions and there are things that you know our our fathers and mothers and grandparents give us things that we can carry with us that 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 can aid us in today, you know. And I was looking at like, you know, like people would say, don't don't go grocery shopping on an empty stomach, cause uh, you know, you go in there, you are gonna buy at the whole store, you know, you hungry. Or, that is true, cause I just did that, yeah. <laughs> you know, or you know, you're someone someone to say something like. Uh, you know, it's best to, you know, for for preparation, their traditions of, hey, look, um, you know, taking out your 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 clothes at night, you know, being prepared for tomorrow, um, it just helps you for with your preparedness. And when I was thinking about these like landmarks, I was looking at it just from a a standpoint of how we can, you know, really hold on because we know about the word, right? You know, there's there's the the stuff that the apostles and um. And, and all the disciples that the Bible talk about the works that they've done, those things can't be removed because, um, you know, they they are the word of God. They they stand firm. They stand on their own. And our primary job is to defend it. But there are there are things that our that our parents, even those who may not be in the church that have given us, you know, wisdom that that, that they have given us that we can take today that can you know, keep us on a, on a path as, as far as just on how to navigate sometimes through, through, through this world. Um, you know, there are principles that your parents may give you that is just, that is just wise of, you know, uh, you know, you got parables in, 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 in the, um, in, in, in the Bible, but then you have certain parables that they give us like, don't, don't uh don't hang around dogs because you know you you know they 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 might give you fleas okay they're not telling us the the you know literal dogs they're talking about bad people like hanging around bad people so um when when I when I when I just think about this I guess I was just kind of thinking outside the box a little bit um where you know sometimes you know the things that your 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 parents that they that they give you you know even whether they are not in the um if they are not in the church you know, some of those things are foundational to, you know, you being a, you know, a wise person. And 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 I would just say, don't, don't overlook some of those stuff. Yes. You know, we know that at the end of the day, the Bible is what we stand on, but there are things that your parents and your grandparents give you tools that they give you that you can hold on to that, that can be passed down because they come from wisdom and, and have been proven as long as they don't contradict what the Bible says then, you know, you it can be used. Amen. God bless you. You know, and I'll take you higher here in just a minute, but Proverbs, Proverbs, I'm going to forgive me, uh, Deuteronomy 27 and 17, this was under the law, the law of Moses. Curse be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark. And all the people say, shall say amen. And and so, yeah, brother, you, you're exactly right, uh, brother, brother Kennedy. You know, the, the idea, there is some wisdom that was handed down uh, from our parents, not, not necessarily all spiritual, but life principles, you know, words of wisdom that will help us, you know, just to live, live, live better, better lives. And, and I think that really the idea behind what Solomon is saying as well is just make sure that we're not covetous, brothers and sisters, and that, you know, your heart is just so set on evil and having more uh, that you're willing to move uh, your neighbor out of the way to get what, what they want. Thank you, Brother Kennedy. Great points. So, uh, Brother Javier, then EZF8. Oh, sorry about that. That's me. That's Coach B. Okay, I thought I saw Javi here. Okay, go ahead, Coach B. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Javier. You go first. 
Yeah, I just wanted to read uh, Deuteronomy 19, uh, 14, where it says, Thou shalt not remove thy neighbor's landmark, which they of old time have set in thine inheritance, which thou shalt inherit in the land that the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it. You know, the, the tribes of Israel, they received uh, the land promise. And, you know, the Levites, you know, their inheritance was to do the work of the priests, but here in verse 14, don't remove the neighbor's landmark. Don't remove where where because he's got family after him that's coming after her after he perishes or after he dies. You know, and so they have their their locations where they where they went to and you know to move and start to steal a land from from your brethren is is God is looking at, at that as evil and unjust. You know, so I just wanted to bring that out. Uh, just got my attention also just piggybacking uh, when it comes to the Rechabites, the Rechabites, their father told them not to drink, you know, and God told Jeremiah to go to the Rechabites. And, you know, I think he mentioned to him, offer him a drink. And they said, we can't do that. Our father told us not to do that. And so they learned that from their from their father, you know, and so God was expecting his children. Wow. Where's my honor? Where's my uh, obedience as well? Because they're keeping their dad's command. And he, he actually sent them over there to, to give them some wine. But they said, no, our father told us we can't do that. And so, you know, when it comes to our father, Deuteronomy 19, 14, uh, thou shalt not remove that land, neighbor's landmark. That's supposed to be something that they're supposed to be obeying. And uh, spiritually, we can't, we can't move, add, or subtract um to the measurement of the kingdom or the church. It's already been measured. It's already been set in place. Jesus is the foundation. So we can't change the building structure of the church. You know, we can't move into the Baptist, uh, you know, stretch it out to the Baptist arena or the Catholic arena and add their um, material. So just wanted to bring that out, brother. Thank you, my brother. Right. You know, and uh, before closing, thank you, brother. Uh, and and uh, I see the comment that uh, Brother Adams put in. You're exactly right, Brother Adams. It, it, it's stealing. That's exactly what they're doing. They're, they're, they're stealing something that God gave to somebody else. You know, the first people that God killed <laughs> when the church was established were people that took something that didn't belong to them. I want to make sure we understand how serious this is. Ananias and Sapphira lied and they took something that belonged to God. God is showing us an example through that, brothers and sisters. You, you can't take something that belongs to God because God will hurt you. And so they lied about the amount of stuff that they gave. And God said, well, when it was yours, it was yours. But when it was mine, it was mine. And you had no right to do what you did. And they both died. Ananias and Sapphira both died because of that. So we gotta we gotta make sure we take this serious, bro, because in sisters, because God takes this very serious. Go ahead, my brother, uh, brother Val Saint. Yes, I wanted to go back and revisit um Naboth you touched on earlier and how he had a vineyard. We right now we're discussing an inheritance. That vineyard belonged to Naboth. And I wanted to highlight that the characters that we see in the old testament symbolizes Christ. In the New Testament, Naboth had a venue, a vineyard rather, and it belonged to him. And um, this is what it says in the Old Testament concerning the vineyard. This is found in um, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 7. Um, it says, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. So that vineyard was a representation of Israel. Now, this is what happened to Naboth. Naboth had that vineyard. We know it's the reputation of Israel. Naboth was accused of two things because King wicked King Ahab wanted to take his vineyard. He didn't want to sell it. Naboth didn't want to sell it. Jezebel came in there and encouraged him to, you know, they, they put together a plan to take the um, vineyard, vineyard away from Naboth. And that plan was to set up two false witnesses two false witnesses and they accuse Naboth of blasphemy well guess what the same thing with Christ in the Old Testament I mean rather in the New Testament 
Now, remember, that vineyard we talked about earlier, it belonged to Israel. It did not belong to anyone else. But the Pharisees during Jesus' time, they wanted to take it. How do we know they wanted to take it? When you go to Matthew, um, well, Mark chapter 12, it talks about a certain husband man. He planted a vineyard and he left some servants to go look after it. And um, he sent one to go check out, you know, his vineyard and they killed one and stoned another one or whatever. And then it goes on to say um, that in verse seven, but those husbands men said among themselves when they saw that the owner of the vineyard sent his actual son, which was Jesus, they said, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and his inheritance will be ours. Now that inheritance we know is Israel. The religious leaders at that time wanted to keep Israel for themselves. That's like Ahab wanted to keep that vineyard that did not belong to him for themselves. And in the New Testament, this is what they did to Jesus. They set up two false witnesses against him, just like they set up two false witnesses against Naboth. And with Jesus, they also accused him of blasphemy, just like they did in Naboth in the Old Testament. They accused him of blasphemy. Now, old, no bat, no bat in the Old Testament was sent outside the city to be stoned. Same sentence for Jesus. He was sent outside of Israel to hang on a cross. So I was just wanted to point out that the some of the events that we see in the Old Testament mirrors and parallel the life of Christ in the New Testament. Thank you, my brother. Appreciate that, Brother Valsan. Anyone else? Anyone else have anything else? All right. And so, brothers and sisters, just remember, there's a reward. And you look at that last verse, and we'll close this out. Look at that last verse. There's a reward, you know, for those of us who do excellent work. And that's what we have to remember. Proverbs 22 and verse 16, he that oppresses the poor increases riches, and he that give it to the rich shall surely, he says, come to want. He that oppresses the poor to increase his riches. I'm sorry. I'm looking at the wrong. Forgive me, y'all. I'm looking at I'm, I need verse 29. See, is thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. Okay. That's the idea. And so there's reward uh, for those of us who do what God would have us to do. And, and, and again, the idea is we always are to work like we're working under the Lord. Everything that you and I do, we want to do it as we're working under the Lord and not just to be seen by men. I think that's what Paul is telling us in Colossians 3 and verse 23, okay? Any questions or comments? Any questions? Yes, can I? Can yes. I? Uh, it's not from today. I just okay. want to ask a question, please. Sure. Uh, I'm going to read in Matthew uh, 22 and verse 37 to 39. Matthew 30, 22, 22. Verse okay. 37, 38, and 39. Okay. And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Mm -hmm. I say that this teaching us that, well, he is stating there, we, we have to love so much God for God and love others ours, as ourselves, right? Yeah, yes, as ourselves. Uh -huh. Okay, but my I say that to say this here they are teaching, they're using the same text to teach that. Let me see it. Less self love that Jesus love less. That's why he gave himself for people, and it's not that correct. Say that again. Love. Let me see exactly how did he say yeah, less okay. self-love, deeper, less self-love. He that what Jesus did when he gave himself. I said, you understand me? Not really. Uh, look, 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 Jesus, look, love, love, self-less. 
Sound like yes, somebody trying like, to be cute. I love self less. What is that? I mean, somebody trying to okay, that, say it again. That you have to love yourself less. Yeah, than Jesus. Sorry? Than Jesus? You have to love yourself less than you love Jesus? How to say? Well, that's true. That is right. You do have to love yourself less. Sound like somebody trying to be the way you're saying love self love less. I don't, I don't know. But yeah, but the idea this the idea is you have to love God. That's that's the idea. Love God. And then he said, in the second, it's like unto it, you love your neighbor as yourself. The love you have for God is shown in your relationship. That's all he's teaching. The love that you and I have for God is shown in our relationship with humankind. That's it. That's it. Yeah, That's but, all he's saying there. Huh? But, uh, uh, you know, it says, love thyself. Love you. you love your neighbor as yourself. You cannot love yourself less. You show the love of God by loving God, and because you love God so much, then you will help you. You will love the neighbor independently who they are. Amen. But not because you love less, not because you love yourself less. Because for you to show love, oh. you have to know how to love yourself, and then you show it to others. Right. Amen. I, I agree with that. Okay. Yeah. Amen, sister. You're right. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Anybody else got something? Yeah, because my uh, brother, uh, who had their hand up first? I'm sorry, Brother Coffee, Brother Kennedy? Uh, just real quick, uh, Matthew 10, I'm, I'm not sure if this is what the, they were getting at. It's Matthew 10, 35, when it says that, um, for I come to set a man at variance, you know, against his father and his daughter and his mother and his, and his mother-in-law and so forth. That's the, the loving, you know, loving, you know, them loving our, our parents and all these other individuals less but I, I don't know. That just sounds like a whole lot of confusion. I mean, I, mean, I wasn't listening very well. But maybe that thought okay. that's where that thought was coming from. And Brother Kennedy? Yeah. Brother Kennedy? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, the idea here for me in Matthew 22, um, you know, when, when you think about uh, how the relationship that we're supposed to have with people uh, in general, right? Like, we're we're told to pray for our enemies um, we're told to pray for those who are in position of power. Um, and then when, 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 when Jesus tells us here, you know, that the, 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 you know, of course the first command is to love your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. And then he says, and the second is like it is to love yourself of love thy neighbor as thyself. You know, the idea here is you're going to always want the best for yourself. You're going to want to always put yourself in a position to, you know, to do well, to uh, um, you don't want to always put yourself in a position to uh, to to whether it's if you're helping out, if you're the type of person that 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 you know loves education, if you're the type of person that that to love to do good works, if you're the like the, the, you're the type of person that if you're a genuine great person, then the idea is the same things that you would want ensure that you are willing to put yourself in a position to also give as well you know if 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 you're the type of person that you you help the needy or you want to be helped you should always be willing to help if you're the type of person that is always uh looking for an extending hand you should be the type of person to extend the hand as well you know nobody would would, would treat themselves less you know we wake up you know we 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 shower we, we, we brush our teeth, we bathe, you know, we feed ourselves, then guess what? You should be always willing to want to help somebody be fed. You should be one of us willing and if some, to shelter someone if they need shelter. You have to always put yourself in a, in a vulnerable state to always be looking to help another person um, in, in this life goal. So the, 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 the purpose of this, at least for me, when it says, and the second is like this, is to, is thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself most people genuinely love themselves and want the best for themselves so you should want the best for others as well and what the best means is is not necessarily always uh something tangible you know the greatest gift that you can give somebody is bringing them to jesus and and how you do it is a is a is a reflection of love 
you know, you have to know where a person is coming from in order to take them where they need to go. So, you know, when you're talking to your neighbors and you're, 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 cause we should always be evangelizing when you're talking to your neighbors and you're trying to tell them about Jesus, it's not about hijacking the conversation and just trying to force Jesus down their throat, see where they're coming from. So that way you can know how to properly, uh, uh, evangelize know what angles to take i mean i think um uh one of the brethren said this uh, many uh many weeks ago when you look at the com all the conversions in the bible you see is there different angles that are taken because whoever the person is that was doing the evangelism didn't just jump into a state of 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 just telling them about Jesus, it was seeing what, what what direction or what angle they was coming from and then guiding them to Jesus. That's an example of love. So I think we're just supposed to always be in a state of, 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 of looking out for someone else and always wanting to treat a person how we would want to be desired to be treated. So if you're someone who, who wants love, who wants someone to treat you a certain type of way, that is an expression that you should be willing and 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 wanting to give out. If that makes sense. Yes, yes, my brother. Uh, bless you, brother Kennedy. Anyone else? Thank you, sister uh, Hernandez. Yeah, uh, I was just looking. I know this is uh, talking about uh, marriage and Christ and the church in Ephesians five chapter twenty. I mean, verse Ephesians chapter five verse number twenty eight. It's, you know, it, it says, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. You know, as the saying what Brother Kennedy was saying, you know, a person, if you're going to love your neighbor as you love yourself, you know, you're going to take care of yourself. You're not going to do anything to cause harm to yourself. So you should love your neighbors in the same manner. You know, that's that's what that's what I had. All, he, all he's dealing with, brother, and we're gonna we're gonna close this. Is again, he's he's shown us how in Christ the the Ten Commandments are fulfilled. When you and I love God, remember the Ten Commandments. What are they? Well, don't murder. He's not talking about murder yourself. Well, you know, I don't I don't want to commit self murder, and so the idea is I don't murder. I don't do that to my neighbor. Uh, I don't I don't commit adultery. You know, you don't sleep with another man's wife or another man's husband. You don't steal. You're not going to steal from yourself. So he's talking about you don't steal from your neighbor. That's what he's dealing with. Don't bear false witness. You know, you go to court, you know, love your neighbor. In other words, do to them what you want done to you. And I'm, I'm going to qualify this. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to do it back to you. They might not. They may treat you wrong, but you still have to treat them like you want to be treated. You understand? That's what he's teaching there. So you have to love God. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is to love God. To love God. You got to love God. And then you love your neighbor as yourself. You do to people how you want them to do to you, even if they don't do it to you. Still, people lie on you. You can't lie on them because they lied on you. They, they said a false witness against me. I'm a false witness against them. You can't do that. And so that's what he's teaching. All right. Anybody have anything else? Any other, any other Bible question or comment? All right, brothers and sisters, thank you. If you're on here tonight, you're not a member of the body of Christ. I want to plead with you, obey the gospel, hear, believe, repent, confess, get baptized in order for remission of your sins, live faithful unto death, and, uh, and then and only then can heaven be your home, okay? Are there any prayer requests before we close out? Any prayer requests? Any prayer, any prayer requests? We're so good, glad to have Ravindra. I hope I don't miss your name, but uh, Brother Green announced you early. Ravindra Abi, so glad to have you on. And uh, we hope uh, you'll continue to keep coming back. And uh, again, feel free to ask any question, make any comments you'd like at any time, and invite somebody with you next time, okay? All right, anybody have anything else? All right, if not, let's get a quick prayer in. Uh, brother Coffee, are you ready? Can you give us a, a closing prayer, my brother? Yes, that is great. Or brother, uh, sorry, brother. I uh, cannot commute myself to that's why talking. Sure, go ahead. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you go so ahead. much for. Yeah, uh, it's it is an uh, interesting conversation. Uh, so many questions and so many answers. I love the program. I will continue this program, brother. Uh, thank you so much for uh, sister. Uh, this giving the great opportunity. Uh, really, God gives a a great family like uh, this congregation, Church of Christ congregation. I'm so thankful to our Mulapudi Malavar and the Church of Church of Christ congregation. Thank you so much. Amen. Well, thank you. Mr. 
Yeah. Yeah, Pinner. Uh, yeah, sister, thank you, Pinner. Thank you, Abi. We're so glad to have you on, and, oh, and looking forward to having you on. Uh, any opportunity you have to be on, okay, my friend. And God bless you, and stay yes. strong. It's not a, it's not a sprint; Thank it's you. a marathon. Okay, it's not a sprint; it's a marathon. Keep asking your questions and keep growing, uh, brother Lee. You had your uh, mic unmuted, brother David. Is there? Okay, I thought you had a question, sir. No question. That was okay. accident. Okay then. Okay, no problem. Okay, brother Coffee. Let us pray. My precious Father in heaven, we thank you all for this day. We thank you, Father, for another opportunity to, um, to learn more about your kingdom. We thank you, Father, for your manservant, which taught us well tonight. We just pray that all that was said, Father, was pleasing in your sight. We also thank you for our brother that came on tonight who expressed his love for your kingdom. We just thank you for the hospitality and the, and the um, his words of, of encouragement. And Father, we just continue to, that we all continue to fight a good fight of faith. And so, Father, we just ask that you will bless each and every family member that's present here tonight. And we just pray, Father, that you will keep us um, as we sleep in slumber tonight, Father. We just pray that you will be with us. And if it's your will, Father, that we rise again tomorrow morning, that we will be about our Father's business and, Father, continue to, to fight a good fight of faith in this cruel and evil world. So we thank you, Father, for this time of prayer in this, in this gathering. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Coffee. Love you, saints. The love of God, y'all. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. I didn't get a chance to announce our other studies, but good night, everybody. Good night.